welcome to the Black Magic Woman Podcast with Mandanara Bales. I'd like to start this podcast by acknowledging the Kabi Kabi peoples, who are the traditional owners of whose lands where this podcast is being recorded. I'd also like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and acknowledge that this always was and always will be Aboriginal land. We have never ceded our sovereignty as First Nations peoples living in this country, now known as Australia, or as my guest would say, the colony. <laughs> Mm -mm. Represented my sister in terms of like never underestimate the black matriarchy. I was feeling Hi. the vibes before um, I arrived in the studio today. So I am so excited because this is literally, I would say, a year ago, two years ago, we first had a yarn, then we had another yarn. And then you joined me for the January 26th Invasion Day special so if you haven't listened to that podcast have no idea what episode it was but have a look there it's on there jump on our website and you'll find it and um, you'll hear from Chelsea Wadigo but on that note I'd like to welcome my guest today Professor Chelsea Wadigo and my sister it's such an honor and a privilege to have you on the podcast finally. Hey thank you for having me on. Well sis as always um with with every guest that jumps on and I love the format it's all about you know who are you and then what you do comes second it's like you know talk about who we are and where I'm all comes from and then we'll get into what you actually do so I'm going to hand the microphone over to you to let our guests know or share with our listeners and viewers um tell us a little bit about yourself who you are who your mob is where you grew up Sure thing. Well, I'm look before I say who I am. I'm on Yagara country at the moment. Um, born and raised on Yagara country, but I'm a Manjali and South Sea Island woman. Born and raised um, in the outer southern suburbs of Brisbane as the youngest of four, to a black father and a white mother. Um, and I um, moved to Anala um, uh, in my twenties because I married an Anala boy um, and haven't left. Four and double seven represent um, here now. Um, I'm a mum of five. Um, I'm a board member of Anala Wongra, a very deadly community controlled organisation here in Anala. Um, and that runs a range of um, community and social services um, that is staffed by black fellows from our community and doing things our way on our terms. Um, I'm also a director of the Institute for Collaborative Race Research, which is a private research institute that does some really important intellectual work that um, contributes to some political and legal change in this place. Um, and my day job is as a professor of Indigenous health at QUT, where we're building a whole new field of research called Indigenous Health Humanities. Good day. Well, big shout out to our sister girl, Carla Brady, um, who's hey. been doing amazing work in our community. A beautiful Fijian woman who married Johnny Brady. So I can't just do a shout out to Carla without doing a shout out to, to Johnny. But I married a Fijian. So Carla and I um, connected straight away, like in terms of even a sister, um, Kirsten, who I used to knock around with, probably not going to watch this, but shout out to you, Kirsten. <laughs> I just want to go back to Anana. Let's go back in terms of the early days. Sis, what was it like growing up in Anana? Because I moved to Queensland to Brisbane in particular back in 1990. And I was, you know, when I, I remember being in grade eight at Yoronga High and I was 11 years old and I went out to my girlfriend's house at Acacia Ridge and the Filipino family and um, Mona said to me, oh, you should meet my boyfriend. He's an Aboriginal. And I was like, okay, <laughs> not that I'm going to know him because I'm from Sydney. Anyways, this lad called Corey Bell rocks up, right? And um I was like, okay. And he's like, so where are you from? Well, I'm from Redford. He goes, oh, yeah, true, sis. Anyways, Corey became my protector, right? And he was an Anala mm. boy. He looked after me. I was 11 year old. I was 11 years old. There I go. Going to parties, right? Yeah. You know, I was home by midnight. I did the right thing by dad. But if I didn't have Corey there, I could tell you now, I probably would have maybe treated differently or, or not as well respected by the the males that used yeah. to hang around with Corey and other people that used to hang around the city and stuff so because I was known as Corey's little sister 
I literally got through a good five years of knocking around an Arla and going to all these parties and I never once like had to kind of protect myself or, you know, just be worried. I've got eight sisters, sis. I never had any brothers and Corey was like the first big brother that I had coming to Brisbane. So my introduction to Anala was through Corey and I remember the first time I got off the bus, 531, wasn't it? <laughs> Back in them days. And I, I was walking from the Civic Centre and he saw some police, some coppers, and he said to me to run. And I'm like, run? It's like, unless you want to get strip searched in front of me. And I'm like, okay. So I start running and I've never ran from the police before in my life. And he ran the other way. And obviously the coppers ran after him and not me. I was straight back to that plaza, straight back on the bus, straight back home. I went, oh, my gosh. <laughs> that was my first day in Anala. I'm running from the police because I was told that as a young black person, male or female, when the coppers pull you over, they're going to strip search you and he didn't want that to happen to me. Absolutely. So there you go. That's my introduction to Anala. You grew up there, sis. I'm going to well, let you share with us. No, I, did. I, I actually didn't grow up in Anala. Oh. Um, I grew up in Runcorn. There you go. Um, which is not that far away, but in to black community terms, it's a different community. Okay. Because um, yeah. you know how we go. Um, so I grew up in Runcorn, and um, which is very different to Anala. And it's probably the reason why I ended up here. Um, you know, we were in Runcorn, we were one of a few family, black families in the school. Um, we have black families on our street. Um, shout out Beanley Road mob. Um, and our immediate family, like our immediate cousins and stuff, our family are either down Tweed Heads or up in Bowen. And so, because my dad, he um, stayed with our Nana Slocky because um, a lot of Williams mob were living around Sunnybank back in the day. And so we end up in Runcorn. Um, <clears throat> dad worked in the foundry on Beanley Road. Um, and so we've lived there all our lives and mum still lives there to this day. Um, but when I finished uni, well, I met I met this Anala boy when I was at uni at the Callum Vale. Uh, places, that's, the vale. that's how you became associated with Anala. For... Well, well, yeah, I met him. But then I, um, when I finished uni, I always had a rural health scholarship, um, and so I was going to work in a rural community when I I graduated, and I got sent um, all the way to Dolby in southwest Queensland. And we shout out to the mob in Dolby. <laughs> Shout out to Dolby and um and we were still like we were just sort of you know boyfriend and girlfriend that time and he was he was signed with the crushes around that time um and they folded and so he was going to stay in Brisbane and with football and I don't know it took him a few months and he ended up following me out to Dolby and we lived there for a couple of years and worked there and um what I loved about Dolby was the sense of community um, living in a country town. When you go shopping on Saturday, it's, it's, it's an event because you run into mob yarning, you know, Sunday afternoon football, go Dolby diehards. Um, and I love the sense of community. We used to have kids used to stay at a house all the time. Um, you know, I just love the sense of community and um, we got engaged while we were there. And when we, um, we left Dolby, we left Dolby because he got signed with the police Academy um as a result of us getting harassed by police in Dolby um, while we were living there and I got arrested for the first time um on a trumped up you know uh, street charge um and it was that which led him to become a police officer so when we moved back to Brisbane and he got into the academy um I'm like I don't want to give up that I love the sense of community that I was living in that was different to Runcorn um and what I grew up in and starting a family um, I wanted my kids to have the strong sense of community that Anala offers, that sense of belonging, that sense of connection. I mean, we have it with our family, but it's not the same as the everydayness of it, of always bumping into mob. Because when we're 3%, it's hard sometimes to come across mob. We've got to be says, deliberate and conscious about. Especially when you live in a, a city like Brisbane, which is so spread out. Like with yep. Redfern, you know, and I can only just draw, you know, similarities to Redfern. Being on the block, you could walk to Alexandria Park, you could walk to Waterloo, you could walk up to um, Glebe. Like there's all these pockets of black fellas that can congregate and come to Redfern or the block where they used to back in the day. And there's a community now that have moved back to the block. So a big shout out to my little sister, Binoy, who's raising her children on the block. Um, you know, seven generations of my family connected to Redfern to the block in particular. Yep. So I, 
I know in terms of leaving Redfern and coming to Queensland, we moved to Enerley Road, which is right across the road from the old Bogger Road prison, and there was no mob. So you had to go out to Woodridge, you had to go out to Ipswich, you had to go out you could to Anala, you could go out, you know, you could go to West End, which is only, you know, 10 minutes down the road, but you couldn't just walk to go and see mob. I've been to mob as an everyday thing. So you're um you know, it's funny when we first when we first like got married, we were starting a family and people are like, oh, you live in Anala, it's not safe. And I used to explain to people that Anala offers a sense of safety in a different kind of way for black fellas, that sense of cultural safety that you speak about. Um, you know, my kids got to go to Wandara Kindi. Um, and, you know, my eldest boy, Kihi, he's 20 this year, but his, his bus driver was Uncle Gordon, Uncle Gordon Barney, who drove the bus when Matthew was going to kindy. Um, Auntie Evelyn, bless her, who's no longer with us, was his kindy teacher and was then our kids' kindy teacher. Yeah. Um, you know, that tradition, that connection. Um, they play football at Western Isla, um, going to school at Anala State School. They got to do dance as part of um, just that's what they did. Yeah. Um, and so there was just this sense of safety and belonging that these kids, people know who these kids belong to. Um, if they play up, someone's going to see it. Of course, there's um, an auntie or an uncle yeah. there. Yep. And, and so I wanted my children to have that strong sense of belonging and connection to a place, even though it's not our country. Yeah. Um, black fellows all over the place have forged communities um, in a historical and contemporary context um, to maintain our connections to each other and that, that sense of safety and, and, and love that we give each other. Yeah. Um, grief too sometimes, but never mind. Um, so, yeah. That's I, important, sis, when you said in terms of grief sometimes. When you're losing people at the rate that Aboriginal people are dying at, like there is a funeral, if not once a week, twice a week. So being part of a community, you have this extended support network that constantly wraps their arms around the family and the community as a whole. And obviously it happens way too often. But I always say with, with um, single mums, and I'm not running down my sisters here, but, you know, four of them are single mums. But I'm thinking, hold on a minute, you had all these sisters and mum and dad to help you raise these children. Whereas in white fellas, if they're single mums, they're single mums. They're on their own. Yeah. We've got aunties and uncles and all these extra grandmothers um, to help support us and raise our children. That's the positive. But the other part, I'm, I'm, yeah. in terms of funerals and sorry business and grieving, uh, it's not always funerals. It could be kids that have been taken by the system. It could be another yeah. life lost to the system where family come together and grief so we're yeah let's not talk about grief loss and trauma well, and but it's important to highlight also, isn't it yeah but also I mean grief in terms of conflict you know like our communities are wonderful places but of course there's conflict and for me it's also um having to navigate community conflict because not everyone loves everybody all the time yeah. um and 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 we have our, our our business we have to deal with um, but for me, that's been an important training ground in terms of the work that I do, um, that I'm accountable um, and get growled at, um, get called out. Um, but it means, though, having a training ground like this in terms of that, that grounding is when I've got to go and deal with the violence of white fellas, that's nothing. Um, that's nothing to me because I've been trained well yeah. um, in terms of even the people who have been the most violent, um, it's been a gift for me in, in, in learning to navigate some of that stuff. So I don't want to give the false impression that, you know, black communities, we all just love each other all the time. No, and we um, shouldn't have I, to I, either. <laughs> no, but I really value the accountability of living in a black community, yeah. doing work for mob, um, that I don't, my work isn't about nine to five, it is every day all the time. And um, someone can see me at the shops and call me out. Um, and I value having that accountability mechanism that I'm answerable to people beyond myself, particularly if you're going to go and talk about black issues. Um, well, what is your relationship to black people then? Exactly. Um, yeah. Not outside of your occupation, you know? Exactly. Um, so I, I, you know, well, I did this for my kids in terms of their connection and, um, and my, you know, my husband's family being here for generations and my kids still come up from school and stay at Nans in the afternoon and we've got aunties here and, and help with all that stuff. Um, it's also been a really important um, grounding for me that I really value, even with the good and the bad that comes with that. And very, very similar to this in terms of red film, when people go, oh, you're from the block. Like if people want fellas that I'm talking to at different events, as soon as I say I'm from Redfern or I grew up on the block, it's like I can I can see people just trying to 
trying to think about, okay, well, this is interesting. Or, right, you're in, a, in an Uber and, oh, you know, when I, I've got a driver in Sydney, really deadly fella, because I am sick of doing cultural awareness in Ubers. I'm so sick of it. <laughs> so having a driver who knows me and knows my life and is an amazing Sikh man, big, big shout out to Karan and the Sikh community who do amazing things, especially during the floods and the fires, are the first people there um, that are there, you know, feeding people and making sure people don't go without a meal. When he picks me up, he doesn't, doesn't want to engage in conversation. He knows I'm exhausted. He knows I've just jumped off a plane. But if he does want to engage in conversation, he lets me initiate it because yeah. he knows I'm about to go to an event where I'm going to actually then give so much of myself. The last thing I want to do is spend an hour doing that before the event and then getting back to a hotel, jump in another Uber. But in terms of Redfern, that stigma is still there. Oh, that's a tough place. Or are and you taking for granted me to talk to you there? Like a taxi. Yeah. Well, people take for granted even the, the fact that you can get to the place you want to go to. Like, you know, it's still challenging to get a taxi to um, for black fellas or even an Uber to go to a black space. Um, and, you know, I still have to navigate that in terms of can you please take us to an hour? Yes. Um, I love like the fact even that even if you pay up front, no matter what your occupation is, you know. Doesn't matter. Listen, I was in Sydney just a couple of weeks ago to watch my nephew Bawali play, deadly young black kid from Redfern representing for the Sydney Kings. Um, we were literally down there for the Indigenous round, brought all the kids down first time to see him in the flesh because he's been playing for the University of Hawaii. So we've been watching him on ESPN. First time, you know, we're a mad basketball and rugby league family. We get down there anyways, we're in, we're in the city at the Marathon and this is the first morning. I've got two little ones, a five-year-old little one, Tiger Lily and my 10-year-old Jida. I go to the taxi stand and I jump in. It's a Saturday morning and we're going to go watch the two younger boys play for Redfern. And I asked him to take us to Redfern and he literally turned around and said to me, can I get you to pay up front? It's like 8 a.m. in the morning. I have two kids with me and I've just walked out of the Marathon World Towers and you're asking me to pay up front. So, you know, as if I'm, I'm going to have an argument with two little kids, right? So, yeah, no worries at all. I get the credit card. And he said, I'll just charge you $60. And if it costs a bit more, I'll take it off the card after. So we dropped the kids there. I go pick my husband up. He was waiting. He went somewhere, pick him up, put him in the cab. And we finally get back to the basketball, come to $88. I said to Peace when we got out of there, I said, do you know that lad made me pay up front? He says, what? I said, yeah, yeah, but... At the end of the day, sweet, I didn't want to argue with him. It's too early in the morning. I just wanted to get to the basketball game. I didn't want to miss the game for the boys. That was day one. On day two, right, walking out um, of a restaurant in, in the city, hailed down a taxi, and I just said to him, on my own, I said to him, oh, can I please go um, back to the, the hotel? It's going to the Pullman Hyde Park. And he asked me, did I have cash? And I said, no, I don't have any cash, but I've got a card. He goes, sorry, my FPOS is broken. <laughs> So two times within 48 hours, I kind of was refused. If you think about it, I was refused, but I was definitely racial profiled. And it always happens in Sydney, always. Well, I was on Ghana country last month and I had to deliver a lecture to the Academy of Social Sciences and um, on race of all things and um, caught up with mob afterwards. And, um, you know, we're outside the casino, re ready to go home, a short cab fare, um, light was on, um, and the cab refused us, even though I offered to pay up front and pay more than the ride was because I knew it was a short fare. Um, he refused. Um, and I have a hard time not contesting that because of the work that I do and, and what I know. Um, so the police were called. I was arrested, detained in custody uh, for five hours um, and released without charge. And that's just trying to get home. And I said to the police, he's refused the fare. On, there's no grounds for refusing our fare. The light was on. He wanted to take the white couple behind us, but not our fare. He's breaking the law, not me. Can you at least give me a lift home or get me a cab to get me home? And they instead detained me in custody. Of course, of course, because you're being a public Just nuisance. To get home. And this is after the professor does a, a lecture at Unreal. the Academy of Social Sciences. See, look, sis, we, and, and I'm being straight up now, right, we ain't the blackest in terms of our features, right? Yeah. But in terms of how we live our lives and how we've been raised and socialised, 
we're both known as as Aboriginal women, Murray women, Black women, Koori women. We're known because we've grown up in a community, we're accepted in our community, and we, I guess, have contributed to our community as well. But we could actually identify as anything but Aboriginal if we chose to. Like I could be Indian, I could be um, Pakistani, I could be Greek. I worked at the Greek club and they still spoke Greek to me after 10 years. So if we wanted to fly under the radar says, or go undercover, we could. But like my mum and dad, my grandmother, her brothers and sisters were out in the streets fighting for us to become citizens in our own country. And as, you know, m- m- mum and dad have both passed, I know that they would be literally rolling in their graves to know that their children don't feel comfortable or even confident to be proud of who we are, you know, as, as black people, as Kuris. So in the back of my mind, sometimes, I'm, I'll be honest with you, sometimes I think about how easy life would be by not identifying as Aboriginal. But at the same time, I wouldn't want to be any other race in the world, right? We are yeah. the only living continuous culture in world history and we have survived colonialism to a certain degree. We've survived the assimilation policy. We've survived the stolen generation era. And we're here still, you know, we're still here. I love that T-shirt. Um, there's yeah, a bird yeah. and key. Dark and disturbing, still here. Absolutely love it. Mm-mm. But, just, you know, don't you agree? Like, we could fly under the radar if we want to. But it's hard not to be black, especially how we talk and interact with with anybody. Yeah, I mean, I'm conscious of, um, you know, my fair skin privilege. I remember trying to get a house to rent in Dolby and I, Matthew would come with me and he's, he's what Dr Jackie Huggins says is cosmetically apparent, Aboriginal. And um, them just refusing to let us, let us even look at houses. And so I... I then went to different real estates and I wore my glasses, my work badge and made him stay outside and I went in by myself and I was able to secure a house. It wasn't the best house, but we got a house and I knew I could, you know, weaponize my light skin privilege in some kind of way. But growing up, because mum's white and dad is cosmetically apparent, Aboriginal, there were times where I'd go up with mum and I'd go up with dad and I'd see how they'd be received differently. And so from a young age, I was, I was annoyed at, at the, the difference in that treatment. I could see that the world worked differently when I walked with my black father than when I walked with my white mother. Even just something as trivial as the checkout chicks at Coles up the road and how they would greet them if, you know, when we'd go into the shop. And that, that sense of um, just being indignant about it and real stubborn and hard-headed. Um, you know, I remember All Stars, I think it was the first, oh, it was one of the All Stars where we won, I think. Yeah, we won and we're at the Norman B. And mob were everywhere. I think you might have been there that night. And I was there. Was the, it was the best night. It was a know, blackout. Was I remember. I remember Wes Patton turning up in a Ferrari, a red Ferrari, <laughs> literally, a brother from the block a, outside and that the night was the best. And it was like black fellas were winning that night. But and again, outside a casino, uh, me and Matthew had a best night. We're going home, hop in the cab. And he, light was on, and he said, um, when we said we were going to the mail, he said, no, get out of my cab. And Matthew's always been, fine, just get another cab. Where I'm like, nah, hold on. I'm the same. His light was on because I'm the stuff and one. We're taking us. No, we're I know that, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, and the, and the cab driver's like, get the f- out of our cab, sorry. But he, he swore at us. He like, yeah. was really aggressive, said, get the f out of my out of cab. And that night, I remember we ended up getting a, another cab home, but I remember being really um, annoyed because we couldn't even have that win without having to, to suffer that to deal with, at the end of the night. Yeah, 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 to deal with something negative, just one thing. Like, you know, we just couldn't have our recreation time even in the colony. Mm. And, we, and it doesn't matter that he was a police officer, I, that I'm an academic. We couldn't exactly, get a lift yeah. home that night. And so it was a bit annoying because we grew up in a, we grew up, Dad had a very strong sense of rise above. You know, turn the other cheek, outperform. You know, that's them. We're smile. Them anyway, so. Smile. My mum and dad always said, right, just smile at people. Even when they're saying the most demeaning things to you, just look at them and smile. <laughs> like, it's taken well, me a long well, time to go from headbutting to smiling. 
well, dad always say, here, let him go, see what happens. So he always believed that that always comes back to them. Of so course, you don't have Emma. to do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let him go. Um, but this hard head, I'm like, I, I'm a bit more of, I think, my indignant white mother. Yeah. Um, and I forget that I'm not a white woman. And so there are times where I think that if I know the rules and know my rights, so like white women do, that somehow I can navigate this thing and I forget that my body, even in its light skinness, um, will they will put you in your place um, regardless. And so I've had to like, um, I still, I'm still challenged by that. Um, I still can't um, accept the, the location they try and place us in. And it gets me in all kinds of trouble, but it also offers me all kinds of learnings around what do I tell my children about how to navigate this place? because our parents grew up in a different time than what we did. And there were different strategies that they had to use in their time. And I think in our time now, there are also different strategies that we can develop and share um, for the next generation in their time when they have to hold the line. Yeah, and I think that's so important, Susan. We're actually arriving at this part of the conversation because I want to say to you, living on the Sunshine Coast, and I have never actually... So that I haven't talked about the positives of living here. It's a very white neighbourhood, especially when the borders were closed. We felt so isolated and literally alone. And that's when I started missing my mob, like even the Brisbane mob. Um, not that I see everyone every day, but at least I could see people if I wanted to. But in Redfern, you know, I started missing this sense of community and people like, there is a black community here. But in the, in the last 18 months, I haven't exactly met everyone and been able to really socialise amongst you know black fellas that live here on the coast but it's only been in the last couple of months maybe six months that the football team the families the mums and dads um that we've started to kind of get to know each other because we went away to Charleville remember Tiger Lily crying because we were in a a caravan park and she wanted a five-star hotel and she wasn't <laughs> impressed with the accommodation options in good old Charleville we had our standards Yes, we do. And um, Tiger Lily's five and, you know, knows nothing but the best. And that's that's what I want for my kids. But living here on the Sunshine Coast, I've chosen this lifestyle um, because, you know, what I keep thinking about it, the dreams of going one day I'm going to retire, I'm going to live here. I thought, why wait till we retire to go and live in a place that we hollered at? So having yep. the privilege to be in a position to actually buy a home, especially in the whitest neighbourhood, and, like, I've got two T-shirts today, sis. I've got this one for when I went and had my breakfast this morning and the always was, always will be another Clothing the Gaps tea. I, I, I can't, it's not that I can't wear it down the road, but I don't feel comfortable because I make other people uncomfortable. And i rather not deal with that as I just want to sit and have my breakfast and not deal with everyone staring at me. The football teams have been amazing. Right? The parents, we started to connect with them, build a relationship because we're three days away with them went to an RSL, had a meal with them. And that did a lot for my kids. They knew that, you know, they played with the kids, but Peace and I, you know, training nights, we drop them off, don't go to training, go to football game, but go and sit on our own. Basketball, one or two parents in the last two years have said hello. You know, and so in terms of just turning up to the school and doing drop-offs, not seeing another black face when there's a thousand kids at Coolham yep. State School, I love the fact that even though I don't feel comfortable. My kids, they love being here and they don't want to move. They love it. So the, the fact that they've been able to find their feet here has been amazing. But they've also dealt with a lot of racism. I've talked to the principal once about Lemecki dealing with racism. Um, I know for a fact that he's trying to do a lot in terms of, you know, educating the school. But it's our kids now. Like, as parents, you know, when I said to my little fella just the other day, um, he said, Mum, you know, I'm going to do the um, New Zealand National Anthem today for Anzac Day Parade. You know, peace is a very proud Kiwi, you know, still got his New Zealand passport. So my kids identify as Aboriginal Kiwi Fijians. So today was an opportunity for them to get up and embrace and celebrate their Kiwi heritage by being on stage and singing the New Zealand National Anthem. So when my little father said to me, Mum, you know, I, I, I'm a Kiwi and I love being from New Zealand, but I'm still a Mariano. And I said, yeah, you're a black fella. 
And he says, yeah, but my friends don't understand. He's in grade five. My friends don't understand. I said, doesn't matter about your friends, as long as you know who you are, that's what's more important, right? That's what's important, that I've been able to raise him as a, I wouldn't say he's that confident yet in his skin, but I've been able to raise the kids, you know, to be confident enough to be black, to be Aboriginal and to live here on the sunny coast and not deny their identity or not be ashamed of their identity. Absolutely. So there's this thing called racial socialisation and it's the task that black parents have raising healthy black children in a social world that demonises that blackness. And everyday black families are making decisions in terms of our children and and not just what school they go to or how they're doing it in this subject, but their full sense of self. Um, because I remember Vernon Aki talking about, you know, every day he leaves his house, he experiences violence. Um, black fellas do experience that every day and it's the remarks in random subjects from classmates. But my kids um, came through Wandara Kindi, went to Anala State School, and then in high school I sent them to private schools. And um, they've all, except one, have returned back to Anala because the daily indignities and insults um, and they had to leave physically the community to go to school each day. And one of my kids, um, I I was rousing one of my my kids about dinner time. I said, you know, dinner time, I want you down at the the table. Let's talk over making dinner. And one of the kids said, um, some days in the afternoons, I just need to be in my room and, and have some time out because it's really hard that I'm at a workshop at an Alawangra with mob and we talk and laugh a certain way. And then when I get on the train to go to school with my white friends, I've got to remember that I've got to talk differently um, and that they don't understand. Um, and this kid was physically exhausted from that labour. Of course. Or having to yeah. do that. It is. It's mentally exhausting. And so I said, I said you know what? And I said, you know what? We can pull you out of that school. I don't want you to have to navigate this. Like being a teenager and high school is hard enough without having to carry that labour. And because they were copying all kinds of comments, because this is one of my fairest kids as well. So their Aboriginality was being discounted every day, as well as then having to deal with Aboriginal issues so that they got it from both, both ends. And since coming back to Anala to go to school, this is the kid that walks out of the anthem every week on assembly, has found their, their, their sense of self. And um, they got up and spoke at the book launch um, at the end of last year and, um, and just spoke about knowing who they are and being strong in that. And, and I had to trade off what I thought was a high quality education for a sense of belonging and connection so that this kid could go to school each day and not have their identity being contested every even in it was in Japanese, there were like racial slurs coming up around black fellas. You know, even the most random spots, this kid was having to navigate this stuff. And they still have to deal with it um, at school, but they have a, have a strength in their position now that they didn't have when they were going to that private school in the white neighbourhood. Um, and it was a learning for me to go, okay. And then one of the other kids saw how they changed and, and then they said, I want to leave too and come back to Anala. Yeah. Um, so I've got four now back at Anala coming to school and one at a private school still because... It just I've got the same was, you know yeah same experience with yeah. Kasaya and um, Kasaya's mum is a Kondamuka woman Pitta Pitta woman and has the same father as my kids I claim all five of them as mine but I only gave birth to the three little ones Kasaya was at Lewis Hill and we got a scholarship for her there and um, year seven year eight year nine and then George Floyd's death or murder <laughs> And one of her friends literally said to her when she was upset, because she's going to protest, I'm making placards in the lounge room, my kids are being exposed to nearly every, like at least 30 black faces that are part of the deaths in custody list. So my kids were at the table asking me questions, who's this mum, what's that? So we're going to give these posters out and we're going to, you know, make sure that these names have a face and people can see, you know, Elijah Dawoodie, they can see Miss Do, they can see Annie Tanya Day. I, I did that not knowing that I was going to start these conversations with my kids at home. So the kids were feeling quite emotional in that week leading up to the protest. And one of Kasai's little girlfriends said to her, why are you upset for? He was just a N-word. She said the, the N-word. And my daughter said, Kasai said, you can't say the N-word. But why are you upset over George Floyd? He was just an and I was like, 
So she said, you can't say the N-word. She's like, well, I'm not calling you a N-word, am I? And said the N-word again. So from that moment, I could tell you now, I, she, she kind of put herself out there for the first time. And yep. she lost friends. Well, she didn't lose friends, but she definitely didn't feel that she was part of the group anymore. Oh, not one of her little girlfriends supported her. No one knew how to stick up to, or stand up to the that that kind of nasty. The mean girl in the group had to be as strong as our our kids had at an early age. I still remember the first year um, one of my kids started the private school, and um, it, it was a uh, where you could start at, at junior, and um, he got called the N word at school over a handball or something. And I remember um, when I picked him up, I just sort of said, "How are you feeling?" I didn't make a big deal about it, but just you know, wh where are you at with this? And he said. Um, well, look, maybe when I was younger, it would have affected me, but now I'm older, I'm kind of used to it. Now, he was 11 at that age. You know, our kids have to deal with racial violence from a very early age in the playground um, all the time. And, um, yeah, I think people have no idea how strong our kids have been forced to be. And that's what I love, uh, you know, when I, I don't force my kids to not stand for the anthem. When I'm at the school assembly, I don't stand for the anthem. Neither do I. Um, but it's... I let them make come to their decision, and yeah. um, the one child who 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 refuses to stand for the anthem and gets escorted out every week as a result of it, it was after coming to the only Joyce Clark rally, and it was I think the next day they just said I can't stand for the anthem, and that child got bullied by teachers, not just classmates, by teachers throughout the day, and they end up walking out of the school grounds and coming home. And at this time, I was over in Bali on a riding retreat. I'd flown out of the country and, um, and she'd come home and dad got us some McDonald's and, you know, loved them up. Of course, and, that's what um, but, Yeah, and then went back to work. And But they sent the school-based police officer with the gun on his belt to come and check to see where this child was. So I had a child uh, fearing their life because the police had turned up with a gun and I got the phone call from them in the kitchen hiding underneath the bench saying, can they, can they enter this house? Like this is the violence our kids have to experience just in, in being who they are in, in standing up for what they believe in. But I want to say, sis, really quickly, and I know that we're going to wrap up in a, in a few minutes' time. Tell me about, like, first of all, I know, tell me about the award. I, I really want people to know that, at a very young age, um, Alice said that at the University of Queensland, where she was working at the time, um, she awarded you a university medal and there was two awarded in that year. Tell me about the university yeah. medal because I want people to know, because you wouldn't talk about it, because it's seen as no. big note, but I, we can big note for you, right? Bless, thank you. Well, it was, um, I did a three-year undergraduate degree program in Indigenous health, and so it was a black educational environment that I was at at UQ, which, and that's why I, I really, that was a strong training ground for me in terms of everyday learning with black fellas. Um, and, but I did honours um, when I moved out to Dolby, um, and I did a research project while I was out there, and um, I got first class honours, so I was working full-time and studying full-time. Um, and bless. And um, so I was wasn't there with my cohort. It was just you know the the, the medalists and stuff. And I think Annie Lil was on uh, on Senate at the time at UQ. She was on the board um, yeah, on the Senate. Yep. Yeah. And um, I remember afterwards um, her grabbing me and saying, "I'm so proud of you." And I just I still cry when I tell the story. And she handed me a hanky when I was crying. And it was that sense of belonging in a white space. Um, that we give each other, even if we're only one or two. Um, and I just, you know, remember to this day, um, you know, that even though we may not have relations, we people, our people are watching us um, and, you know, we, we can be working hard and forget. Um, and to know that um, she, she, she knew who I was, um, that she was proud of me in that very white space at the University of Queensland, that I didn't, I, you know, I'm first in family to go to university and I wasn't encouraged to go to uni. Um, in fact, dad was wild that I was going to uni because he said places like that are not meant for people like us. Yeah. Um, so we never grew up with a sense of social mobility or, you know, trying to get, get out of Runcorn and get a bigger house or any of that stuff. It was just be a good worker and of do course. good, be a good person.
Um, and so to be in that university environment, which is so foreign, and to have, you know, of all people, Dr. Lilla Watson, um, and and knowing her story at UQ and the fight that she had to go through to be recognised as the first Indigenous academic, you know, um, like to know that we're not alone and we're following in the footsteps of some amazing people that have created the space for us to be here, mm-hmm. um, still here, yes, um, but in, in all kinds of new spaces. And, um, and, and they I've, finally I've, acknowledged you know, her, sis. They finally acknowledged her and... She was awarded an honorary doctorate, um, and and I don't think many people know this, but back in the nineteen early nineteen eighties, there were no indigenous support units in universities for our mob. So we're pretty sure that UQ established the first indigenous support unit, and that was Art Lilla, a Ribna. There's this lad she talks about Ribna, someone, and Kev Carmody, the three of them. That's right. Set up this and little day, To this day, she remains, you know, one of my intellectual idols. Um, and the classroom has been at her kitchen table and, and she was instrumental in helping me navigate a whole lot of stuff dealing with institutional violence in, in the academy um, in just such a generous way um, and guiding me through my thinking and reminding me who I was um, and, and, you know, in terms of Indigenous terms of reference and operating on our terms, and that really held me in my darkest moments um, and that gift that she continues to give so many of us in getting us to remember who we are, where we come from, and standing strong in that irrespective of what gets thrown our way. So it's in terms of um, going for the job at QUT to be an equity trainer to roll out QUT's mandatory cultural competence training, I set up Black Card with Aunt Lilla, who is my grandmother's sister, and Dr. Lilla Watson. We set Black Card up together, but we were struggling to make any money in the first kind of two years. So I'm on Centrelink, CEO on Centrelink, true story. <laughs> dad was helping pay like my CEO. rent. Yeah, Dad was helping pay my rent, and only Lilla was paying the childcare bill. And I'm telling you now, that was $1,000 a week for rent and childcare that I was supported with. So I didn't, I couldn't get a bank loan. Aunt Lilla's, you know, 85 this year. We only set the company up nine years ago. So we set this business up where she was like 74 years old. And um, anyways, Aunt Lilla wanted to bring that kind of university level education to the mainstream public, corporates, anybody, everybody, students, black fellas, you know, to be able to consolidate what Aboriginal terms of reference is, to operate on our terms is the most I don't know, it's, it's just so strengthening in terms of culturally, being culturally yep. strong to go, you know, I know who I am when I walk into a room and I don't have to, I don't have to operate on your terms. I'm going to operate on my terms, whether you like it or not. So anyways, I saw this job at QUT and I said to Aunt Lilla, and I only went to year 12, I got no degrees, right? but I am doing my MBA, by the way. And Aunt Lilla said to me, um, this will be really good for you because everything you're learning at Black Hat, I wasn't facilitating at Black Card back then. It was Aunt Mary, Aunt Lilla and Uncle Charlie. But she said, everything you've been learning at Black Card, you can go and put that into practice with the program that they've developed at QUT. But just for the job interview, as I got out of the car, I felt really sick to my stomach and I rang Aunt Lilla. I said, Aunt Lilla, I feel so sick. Like Peace literally said to me, you are white. He's like, your whole face is really white as he dropped me off. And I'm like, I said, I feel like I'm going to vomit, like I'm really unwell because I was, I was already kind of, I guess I was shifting. Like I was, it was like already I was in this negative mindset. I don't have a degree. I've never been to a university, like in terms of worked in a university, I've never studied. So, you know, it, why am I even here for us? I started doubting myself as we do as black mm-hmm. fellas. So I walk in there, five people, four out of five had done the black card two-day intensive. So I walked in and hugged people because I was so nervous, but I'd formed a relationship with them because they'd all done black card training because they were all part of equity services. And this was the, the equity team that I was going to work in. The one person I didn't hug was this really kind of stiff white fella um, who I didn't know. So he just kind of shook my hand. I'm like, okay, I'll shake hands then. Sat down. But anyways, the, the phone call without Lily, you know what she said to me? 
She said, my girl, they don't know what you know. You can operate on Aboriginal terms or you can operate on their terms. You've got two lots of knowledge systems or bases. They've only got one. She said, so you know, you know more than them. And I was like, oh, my gosh. From that moment I walked in there and I knew the confidence within me. I, she said to me, you know, you need to stand strong on your terms and when you feel, when you feel that you're losing your confidence, she said to me, that's when you're being kind of forced to participate on their terms. So bring yourself, be, bring yourself back. You need to be conscious that they don't draw you over into their terms because then that's when they win. But mm-hmm. it was interesting how she explained it to me that when, you're, when you've consolidated what Aboriginal terms of reference is, the ground underneath you is rock solid. She said, but when that ground starts to feel like sand and there's kind of a shifting underneath your feet, that's when your confidence, you know, you're losing your confidence. She said, that's when you're being drawn over and that's the moment you go, bang, I'm not going to let them draw me over into their terms. So I smashed the interview, got the job, two years of having out Lilla as my support person. But you know what my dad said? Similar to your dad, you know what he said to me? He said, Mari, you don't know what them people are like. They're going to eat you up and spit you out. And he said, I wouldn't go for that job. Stick to Blackheart. Stick to the support and the safety of the old people, the elders. He said, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. And Aunt Lilith said to me, don't worry about your dad. <laughs> said about Blackheart, we're, meant to roll, we're literally meant to wind the business up because we were trading insolvently about seven years ago. And I promised dad that we were going to shut Blackheart down. And we... I leave there, get home, Aunt Lilla rings me. My girl, don't listen to your father. <laughs> said, we started with nothing. We've got nothing to lose. We've got, we've got something that nobody else has. And look, nine years later, bought a house here at Mount Coolum. There's about 21 Ooh. people that are on our books. And we've been able to create this amazing framework that has been, you know, implemented across Commonwealth Bank. We're rolling it out at ANZ Bank. We're working with people like Google. We've got Amazon knocking on our door. And Aunt Lil and I keep thinking about the old days when Dad said, you know, you need to wind the business up. At least the QUT job, two things. I was able to pay my rent. Still Aunt Lil then paid my kinder bills because Dad thought we're winding the business up, so I had to stop taking money from it. And the second thing, having a QUT lanyard around my nexus, I was able to walk into shops in Westfield at Carindale and I was treated differently for the first time ever. I also got our first house because the first house that we're living in with Peace and I and four kids, we were in a one-bedroom house in Carina because of racism. We could not rent a house. So run on black card, contract to QUT, Peace was a war fee on about 120 grand, and we could not, with our collective incomes, rent a house in Brisbane not that long ago. So yep. QUT, and I always thank QUT for this, that having that QUT staff car, that lanyard around my neck, got us a house. So we moved from a one-bedroom house where six of us slept in one room for two years, and we moved into a five-bedroom house. So QUT, having that job, not only was I able to stand on my own two feet and kind of move out of the shadows of the elders in terms of a black card and build that kind of confidence of dealing with academics because it was, it was a hard slog two years of rolling out manager training there at QUT, but it's made me who I am today. You know, yeah. that thick skin to deal with anybody um, and, and the most, some, some of them were the most beautiful people and some were the worst people, you know, I just didn't think that I would have to deal with that um, as an employee, not as a contractor, as an employee, but have an Aunt Lilla to go home to and to ring and to talk who had an experience but as a staff member, she was actually yeah. deliver, you know, rolling out training to students. I was dealing with staff and that's a whole different ball game. So, yeah, I just want to, you know, in terms of um, sharing my, you know, stories there with, with QUT, there's a whole lot of positives. I'm very thankful of my time there. And I know that you're working there and I'm still associated with QUT. Big shout out to Peter Anderson. Well, Professor Peter Anderson and Professor Abby Cathcart, 
who've invited me to be a visiting fellow uh, of the learning and teaching Sorry. unit. So the work that I'm doing with supports you, sis, and I want to wrap up with basically saying, tell us about your book because you did launch it and um, I arrived late but I was at a party with you. Can you talk to us about your book? Um, so the book Another Day in the Colony is a series of essays um, that I've written that can re be read independently or chronologically um, either way. Um, it's hard to describe what kind of text it is, but it's basically a book written written for black fellas. White fellas can read it and buy it and, and get what they can get out of it. But it was a book that I wrote to speak with black fellas um, about navigating this 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 um, this place. And it draws on my own stories because that's how our knowledge production systems work. That you can't talk about some kind of relationship to it. So I use my stories as a as a way to then think about about this place. Um, and it was you know. Um, uh, released last end of last year by UQP. We've gone into a few reprints since, and um, yeah, it's it's a book that I guess I wanted as a provocation to be in conversation with each other as mob around how we navigate this place. Um, yeah, going forward, I love it. So look for people a little bit, a little bit provocative. There's a few challenges oh. in it, but um, I'm really enjoying the conversation hey, look, I'm going to have with mob. It's written, yeah. written by you, so. <laughs> You, there's no sugar coated, right? You you get what you get when you buy that book and you're reading it. Um, and if you feel offended, you know, maybe you need to do some internal work on yourselves on why you're feeling the way you're feeling when you're confronted with some of the stuff that we as black people and black women, you know, want to say and, and want to share with people. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, so I wanted to just let people know that your book is available. Jump online. They can also reach out to you like do you have a website I don't have a website um, but I also give a plug out for the Institute for Collaborative Race Res Research which is a private company we've set up to do some um, really important work around race and racism and stuff that um, we do we're sort of nerds for high when it comes to race and racism um, so we do all kinds of different uh, work that gets us to do work that doesn't sit so nicely and neatly in the academy um, but I'm very fortunate to be part of a really amazing team of directors, um, Dr. David Singh, Kevin Yaoyi, um, Dr. Lisa McCown and Dr. Liz Strakosh, and we're based at, at Wool and Gabba um, in, the, in the right place at Southside House. And um, we have a website, icrr.com.au. We do some great work with Sisters Inside, with universities um, and all kinds of other places. Um, and so I'm really excited about the work we get to do so that we have the academic day job, but there's also the other work that we do outside of that, that gives us the freedom to think, to strategize and to try and transform this place a little bit. So sis, just before we wrap up, is there anything that you're working on? Can you share with us? Is there anything in the pipeline? Are you writing a paper? Are you thinking about another book? What's going on um, happening for 2022 and beyond? Um, so I'm working on lots of things and it's across lots of different spaces. Um, what, we're, what we're doing at the moment is building this new field of research called Indigenous Health Humanities. And it takes up the challenge that Dr. Little Watson poses to us around imagining a future as far ahead of us as the past that is behind us. And so we're looking at how do we bring um, scholars together, whatever discipline they've been trained in, to, 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 to work on what is Indigenous survival look like in the future? Um, and a lot of the work that we're doing is around health justice and the, the preventable deaths of black fellas in the health system, which is ongoing and every day, tragically. Um, looking at what is an Indigenous critical race theory um, from this place, not just from the UK and the US. Um, and it's a really exciting space, um, you know, the scholarship of Amy McGuire, who's an amazing black journalist, um, the work that she's doing around presencing and the violence against women. Um, it's just a really exciting thinking space that we're um, creating. And so we'll be coming out with some podcasts and writing retreats and bringing black intellectual collectives together um, to strategize survival, both locally and globally. And um, it's, a, it's uh, a credit to the work of the likes of Professor Lester Rigney. Um, and of course, Dr. Lilla Watson, um, who continues to challenge us to think about what it is to operate on our terms in the academy and in the colony every day in this place. Oh, well, absolutely can't wait to get my hands on some of the stuff because it will support us in terms of with Black Card in when people ask us, what should we be reading? Um, yeah. 
who who's doing what what websites are there what handles on twitter instagram what yeah. businesses should they be engaging with so yeah. i'm gonna so i see our we're now on twitter we're on facebook and we're on instagram and we'll be rolling out um the next few months intro to indigenous critical race theory for a range of different um companies and organizations who want to understand race beyond how they emotionally feel about it to engage intellectually and, and what what we can do around race as a structure of oppression so we're excited that should be coming out in, in coming months and um they have an opportunity for, to bring people on board and take them on that journey love it and sis i have literally started a little little thing on the side it's still the same thing but it's the black magic woman book club but i want to get you back on and we just talk about your book so let's, hopefully let's yarn that book <laughs> let's yarn about the book for the book club series so on that note sis I just want to say thank you for giving up an hour, a little bit over an hour of your precious time. And thank you for sharing so much, especially about your family and your children. And next time it'll be a very different interview, right? We'll be like, I'm going to be asking questions like, what are you reading? (laughs) What authors are out there? What did you grow up reading? It'll be a very different um, podcast. But on that note, thank you so much. Big shout out to Kevin Yao Yi. Can't wait to see you when I get back to Brisbane soon. So love you and leave you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, look, it was a, an absolute pleasure. So we'll have to talk about more in terms of the, the it was another day in the colony. That's yeah, the book. All right. One more thing, Thank sis, you. One more thing. In terms of wow. truth telling, in terms of truth telling, I want people to get out to the cinemas now and go and see Leah Purcell's Arnie Lear, I should be saying, The Drover's Wife, The Legend of Molly Johnson. In cinemas in this country, May the 5th, there is a huge trigger warning in terms of the violence, especially domestic violence. Um, there is, there, there's murder, there's rape, there is scenes there that are not so graphical, but you know that it's happening, especially for our mob, um, big, big trigger warnings. But it is definitely a film that every Australian, maybe over the age of 16, should see. So I saw the premiere last it's, week. It's, I, I saw it in, in, at the Brisbane International Film Festival and aesthetically it's, 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 it's beautiful. Um, I know. The story is hard and heavy. But this is the power of black storytellers. And Fiona Foley talks about how do you represent violence without reproducing it. And so, yes, it deals with some really challenging stuff, but it's, it's a really beautiful and powerful story. And, and this is why we need black, more black storytellers telling our stories, yeah. um, because we know they're in good hands and that, and that she's thought about the black audience watching this and having to process it. So, yeah, absolutely. You've got to see it. It's, yeah. Well, it's Roadshow so Village, Roadshow Village backed this film or came to Annie Leah. Um, and in terms of, like, there's no real big names, but, like, she is the big name. She was awarded the um, Chevelle Award on the Gold Coast just last night and the oh. previous recipients of that award are people like Heath Ledger and for her, her contribution to film um, and the arts. So, yeah, I, I can't wait to get Annie Leah on this. If you're listening to this podcast or watching, I'm going to be knocking on your door to get on here and let's talk about your life. But also we need to get more people out there buying tickets to see the, the 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 film otherwise you know a cinema does can't keep the film on if there's nobody buying tickets to see it and it's not making any money then it doesn't last long so high ground simon baker jack thompson was the most amount of money three million dollars that film made with Widiana marika as well hard movie to watch and I said to Annie Lee, let's hope that this movie doubles that, if not triples that. So for everyone watching or listening, get out there and see it. Mother's Day, it's coming out a couple of days for Mother's Day. Mm, yeah, take your mums, but, you know, get ready for um, those conversations to happen after. So on that note, I love you and leave you, my sister. And Thank we'll talk amazing. soon. Mwah. Definitely. Okay. Tara, thank you so much. You're welcome. How deadly was that yarn with my sister, Chelsea Wadigo? Formerly Bond, a proud Mananjali and South Sea Islander woman with over 20 years of experience working with working within Indigenous health as a health worker and researcher. Chelsea's work has drawn attention to the role of race in the production of health inequalities. Her current ARC Discovery Grant seeks to build an Indigenous health humanities as a new field of research. 
one that is committed to the survival of Indigenous peoples locally and globally, and foregrounds Indigenous intellectual sovereignty. She is a prolific writer and public intellectual, having written for Indigenous X, NITV, The Guardian, and The Conversation. She's a founding board member of Anala Wongara, an Indigenous community development association within her community, a director of the Institute for Collaborative Race Research, and was one half of the Wild Black Woman, Wild Black Women radio podcast show with Angelina Hurley. Big shout out to you, my sister. But most importantly, she's also a proud mum to five beautiful children. Her forthcoming book, Another Day in the Colony, published by UQ Press, was released last year in November 2021. Chelsea was awarded a National Office of Learning and Teaching Fellowship, which explored the issue of cultural safety for Indigenous educators teaching Indigenous knowledges within Australian universities. Yeah, there is obviously so much more that we could talk about. So until next time, bye for now. Don't forget to follow Black Magic Woman podcasts on all social media platforms. To keep up to date with the latest episodes and news, head to blackmagicwoman.com.au. You can rate and review the podcast on iTunes and please feel free to share the podcast with your family and friends.